Devin, what's going on, dude? What's up, Raj? We're back. It feels like it's been a while, doesn't it? It does. It feels like we went on a little vacation. Uh, yeah. I don't know how many of you guys tuned into our selectors showcase last week, but we had fun doing it. We did. I know that like YouTube or Facebook or one of them like blocked it because of we played a bunch of Toots records and there was some kind of like copyright. Those haters. Some you know there has us. to. There's got to be a change. You know, let the people play music. We got to find some kind music. of a, some kind of a service. Hopefully, is going to come up that will allow mm. people to play copyrighted music. You know, because we're not trying to steal it. We're just trying to share it. Trying to share it and promote so, the artist. That's what we did with the Toots showcase. Is uh, you know, celebrate the music of Toots Hibbert, and uh, we right. had fun doing it, man. I mean, I, I want. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do some of those showcases again. Different subjects, of course, but. Definitely, yeah, and just um, but you can find it on uh, the podcast. I believe is is uploaded, and all the audio is on there. So that's probably the best place. If you don't subscribe to the Reggae Pod Clash as a podcast, wherever you get mm. your podcasts, please go subscribe and also rate and review while we're there. Review that man. It's like Yelp. Exactly. Give us give us some kind of review. Say, you know, I liked it. I loved it. It changed my life. Just like this show is going to change people's lives today. Just like today's episode. I am super duper excited, man. I've been a fan of this gentleman for years. And when we started this podcast, this is like, you know, one of the people that we were brainstorming on getting in. We finally did it. Today is the day mm -hmm. that Prince Fatty is on the show with us today. And not just Prince Fatty, not just Prince Fatty. Super duper delighted to have singer songwriter Shanice with us as well. Yeah, Fatty and Shanice have been working together, and it's just amazing. Like, yeah, the music is just off the hook. And they just dropped a heavy single called Black Rabbit um, that we'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. But it's before heavy, we heavy do, too. we always start each week with the Tune of the Week segment. And I believe this week it's your turn to go first, right, Raj? It's my turn to go first, man. I have a really, really cool song for you guys. You know me. I love instrumentals. I love keyboard players. And so I wanted to shed some light on... A gentleman by the name of Neville Hines, you know, when I started uh, getting into Jamaican music, you know, you have your Jackie Matus and your Winston Wrights and of course your, you know, a uh, couple other guys that, that sneak in, you know, Lloyd Chalmers, uh, um, that whole that whole thing had a couple of different people uh, playing keyboards that don't really have a huge discography. And Neville Hines kind of sits in the middle of that. He has mm -hmm. a nice chunk, but he's not well, well known. Right. So I wanted to bring some notice to him. This song is called Musical Splen uh, Splendor by Neville Hines. Dig it.
I'm a sucker for yeah. those kind of tunes that that it's not stereotypical. You don't know exactly where it's going. It's a piece of art. Winston Wright had a lot of those songs, right? So he's more Jackie's more funky, soulful. Winston Wright has more of this poetic, artsy kind of um vibe to him. And Neville Hines is right around that mm-hmm. same kind of I think he'd be closer to Winston than than a Jackie. He's got his own flavor for sure. Um but the first time I heard him was, was like a rock city tune called Tit for Tat. And that mm-hmm. tune is just so beautiful. When um just the That's piano, right? Yeah, well, that yeah, that's story? piano. Yeah, that's piano right there. Tit he, for tat, right? A tit for tat is is um there's organ in it and piano. Mm-hmm. But I think it's an organ lead for that one. It's like a rock city mm-hmm. okay, tune. Okay. I want to say it's like Joe Gibbs uh, stable, but that's one of those tunes when people just like just the other week, someone hit me up. It's like, Hey, can you give me some, like a, your top 10 rock steady songs or whatever? And that's hard, always hard. But yeah. that song that kind of defines rock steady. And that song was just so in the pocket. And so that's when I first heard of Neville Hines. He has a, um, I was, uh, had a show in Amsterdam at this place called the milk Vague, and the DJ played a tune. And I was like, what the went up to him? And it was Neville Hines and this uh, song called, uh, shoot, it's a flip side of the worm on Punch. Mm-hmm. Now I'm drawing a blank on the actual tune. Oh, it's going to come to me mid-show and I'll yeah, blurt yeah. it out. <laughs> but but I guess the point I'm getting to is all of his stuff, it's all, you know, it's, it's all killer, no filler. There's really no um, crappy songs from Neville Hines. And so when I heard this one, I was like, wow, mm-hmm. I got to get it. Tune. You know, it's a really beautiful tune. They do that's this piano whole... playing. That's a because it like it sounds piano-y, but it sounds I don't know what it's just a straight up piano that he's playing the lead on that. Yeah, I think it's a um well for sure it's a piano. Yeah, it just kind of sounds a little out of tune and wonky, little uh, old school dope. upright. Yeah, I love it, and the horns complement everything. It, it does a real. I mean, it's one of those tunes like we talked about on the show again. You know, I may not be out um at a DJ night, you know, and throw it <laughs> right. You know, right. 12 o'clock midnight but it's it's a cool little warm-up tune it gets it gets everyone moving so yeah there it is neville hines musical splendor that's the beautiful thing about like this tune of the week segment is that like we get to play those tunes that we don't play out you know right the yeah songs because it's like it works both ways like maybe you wouldn't want to play that song when you're out you know selecting records but the flip side is like some of those you know tunes that you would be selecting there they're not really what you want to like sit back and listen to on a Saturday afternoon you know see that's the mix that's the I think I might have had this conversation with you is that I find myself not really collecting a lot of uh, hits that would be on a greatest hits kind of thing you know right at the same time <clears throat> people want to hear hits at the club so mm-hmm. it's like this whole you nailed it man like the songs that I do have on forty five that are well known I'm really not at home playing those songs i have right they're so ingrained in my head i want to hear the songs that you know i don't hear all the time and i'm like oh man you know so yeah i agree i'm well speaking of songs we don't hear all the time <laughs> that was one and my record this week is mm-hmm. one that i just found um and you know we talk about this all the time that jamaican music is the gift that keeps on giving and no matter how how big of a reggae nerd you think you are you always stumble across a tune where you're like how did i never hear that one and this next one is one of these um i just got this record in the mail a week ago and i discovered it like the week before that Mm. and it's by a group that as far as i know is a one-off never heard of them before but this is a heavy tune check out the lyrics and we'll talk about this on the flip side but this is traffic jam with history book
history book by traffic jam so this is how i discovered that tune a couple weeks ago i've Mm -hmm. been doing this uh i use i try to use the elliptical machine like six six days a week you know but Mm -hmm. it's super boring i do it for 45 minutes and so i always have to have some like project that i'm doing that you know musical something listening to something or watching something and so right now i decided i'm gonna make a spotify playlist that collects all the good reggae on spotify so this is you know this will take me the rest of my life to do Right. But I was listening to this random dub record. I typed in Impact All Stars and this Randy's dub album came up and that the last tune was the was the version side of, of that record. And I was like and they would like fly in little snippets of the vocals, you know. So I was like, mm-hmm. what is this? Never heard of this. And I uh asked on um Roots Nazi Roots, the uh Facebook uh group, you know, where every where the members of that group like within thirty seconds they'll like ID rare tunes for you. Yeah. They were like, oh, that's a history book by Traffic Jam. I was like, okay, um, <laughs> cool. So I went on Discogs, found that copy, um, and I just, that's such a heavy tune. It's 1975. Anything from the mid 70s with that impact label, it's one of those where you just can take a chance on it and you know that it's going to be heavy. And even if you don't love the A side, you're, the, right. the, the version size is going to be heavy because it was, you know, Randy Studio, Impact All Stars. They just had that sound. And I read somewhere, even though it's not, it doesn't say so on the label, I read that that's actually the Whalers band oh, wow. playing on that. And Crazy. so I guess what they mean by that, I mean, 1975, if you're going to list something as the Whalers band, I mean, that's basically the upsetters, right? It's just, right. Like, it's the, you know, the Barrett brothers and totally and everybody, which is crazy because it doesn't necessarily sound like them to me. It just shows like the versatility of that group. <laughs> right. I didn't get that. Yeah. You know, but, um, the lyrics of that tune are what it was so shredding, cool. man. There's the, the break in the middle with the guitar, just yeah, the, that walling out, dude. That that was crazy. And, and the it's cl- it, the clav, yeah, that dude. clav that could be Tyrone Downey, right? Yeah, for sure. Would that, that have been it, with if that's the Whalers band in 1975? Would that be it Tyrone? Sounds Downey? like it would, yeah, because it definitely is. I mean, early, yeah, yeah, if you're talking Whalers, All right? And the lyrics of that tune are just so cool. He's like. He's listing out people he knows. He says, we know about Garvey. We know about Nanny, like the Jamaican uh, maroon hero. We mm-hmm. know about even Bustamante. But he says, but what I can't understand is how this boy gets in our book. The boy called Christopher Columbus. Columbus. And he says, Ooh. take him out of the... And so it's like, take the, the theme of the song is, you know, let's get Christopher Columbus out of the history books because we don't right. need to be learning about him. Um, right. But it's just like a magical combination of like great concept for a, for a tune lyrically, and then right. you know the way they the just the songwriting is excellent. <laughs> it's excellent, and it has like a super ape vibe. I don't know how many of the listeners are like familiar with Lee Perry's classic super ape album, but there's a couple. You know, it's primarily a dub record, but there's a couple vocal tunes on it that mm-hmm. aren't really songs. They're just kind of like chanting things, and that song reminds me of of like the the first song on Super Ape. Which right. is the Zion, you know, Zion's blood is flowing through my mm-hmm. veins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It kind of has that same, like, just same vibe to it. Very um, chanty, you're right, and drawn chanty. out, and just kind of the same kind of uh, meter, you know. But, just yeah, but I'm like hooked on that song right now. And the flip side, like, if anybody goes and looks up um, the flip side of that, I think it's called History Book Part Two, and you can find it on Spotify for all you now, Spotify <laughs> listeners. It's heavy, heavy. And, and and yet here's another band where they sit back and go, okay, check it out. We got a good thing going on, boys. Let's come up with a band name. Let's come up with a band name. Everyone. All right. Traffic, the end of the, jam. traffic jam. Sounds good. 
Man. And it's like, and that they we've talked about this a few times now on the show. It's like, how are you going to come and record such a hit? Mm -hmm. I mean, not a hit, but like such a banger, right? Such a great tune. And then mm -hmm. that's the only thing you ever recorded, you know? It's like, right. that doesn't, it's, <laughs> and Clinton Farron, you know, when we had him on the show, he touched on that. It's like, well, because a lot of people, a lot of these groups were coming down from the country and, you know, they're, they're, you might have a great tune, but if it didn't hit and you didn't make money off it right away, it's like, what, how are you going to financially sustain yourself while you're, there's no grinding it out. You know what I mean? There's no like, all right, let's tour for a couple of years. And it doesn't even work that way. It's, it's a different player, game, you know? a total different game. So it's like we... this song comes out and it's just heavy. And then, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't work out for those guys. And, and you know, that's it. That's our only traffic right. jam tune. That's there it. might be a couple others, but you know what I'm saying? I'd be <laughs> curious to know if traffic jam has a, you know, a handful of tunes. Right. I've never, ever heard of traffic jam, mm -hmm. but now I'm a fan. So now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we're, you know, I'd like to get a shirt. We should make some Impact All Star shirts. That'd be wicked. Yeah. Heck yeah. That's such a great label. Yeah, you can't go wrong. That's the, the best. Like you said earlier. Well, you can't go wrong with Impact. Ooh. Nice segue, right? Yeah, very good. <laughs> Just like you can't go wrong with our guest today on the show. Um, like I said, I've been a big fan of this gentleman for years. I mean, he is. When you talk about modern dub engineers, he's he's at the top of the list. Um, when you talk about producers, whether it's reggae or not, he's at the top of the list. Um, and he is joined. Mr. Prince Fatty and Shanice are on the show today. Well, we're going to talk to Fatty first. So welcome to the show, Mr. Prince Fatty. Yo, yes, guys. Thank you, Roger. Hi, Devin. How you guys doing? Good, Good man. man. Good. Thanks so much for being on. Yeah, man. Look at you Welcome in the studio. Welcome to NW10. Nice. Yeah, this nice. is uh, what we call the fish market. Yeah, yeah. It's like a secret studio Ooh. in uh, the Jamaican neighborhood of Northwest London uh, called Harsden. Yeah, that nice. is the kind of... Like, there's two... two kind of, yeah, heavy Jamaican populated neighborhoods and where all the music and sound systems kind of exist and came from i guess if you like yeah the heartbeat yeah. of london <laughs> nice so yeah nice. we're here actually this desk is is an old mci console which is a, ra a similar age of the same it's kind of the generation just after king tubby's one but it shares the same equalizer but doesn't wow. have the famous high pass low pass filters mm. but it's right. uh it's actually a super early mci console so um, yeah wow. it's a nice room so there you go. Because I know you're a studio. You guys are studio nerds too. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to get, I wanna get in there. I want to look at that place. It looks amazing. Right. Teleport. Yeah, it's there. cool. Jeez. We got old dirty JBL monitors here and Studio tape machines. There's an Olympix tape machine in the corner. Nice. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm sitting up bits. So yeah, look. Um, I enjoyed I enjoyed tuning in. I've been listening to you guys, and I just wanted to. Oh, add, nice. Add, I wanted to add something about Matador because actually he's he's one of my favorite producers and not many people really know about him. His right. output is kind of limited, but because um, I worked with Little Roy and Little Roy started out with Matador, yeah. But if you know his yeah. recordings on the Matador label, yeah. So, um, and stuff so like that. that's right, yeah. And um, so he he did a few cuts for them for him, which were were brilliant. But uh, he told me at the time that basically Matador was really insistent on things being original would often re-record songs if they sounded too similar to others or if the bass line was too similar to another song he was really meticulous and um just as another thing as well also i think he was technically the first person to record dennis brown too so there wow. you go. i don't know if you knew that but he was like Did 12 years old or the 11 Matador, or 12 man. super young before he cut for studio one he, he actually recorded for matador first wow and uh that. who else wailing souls they cut for matador too so the, i love to have a song called gold digger from the matador label yeah. that's Ooh. super cool you know that one right you know, to the, yeah man that's yeah yeah to matador, to... i think matador was was heavy yeah for real roger so, don't you have like a, a matador book do you have a lloyd daily yeah. book in your studio <laughs> just just uh, i'll be back okay. in two hours <laughs> well, I didn't even know. I didn't even know they'd made a book about him. That's I crazy. didn't either. Roger has a. I was at his studio the other day, and he's got a crazy like reggae book collection. And I was like, this, I said the same thing. I was like, I didn't even know there was a Matador book. 
and it's like a sizable book. So, Check this thing out. Wow. Okay. Got this one, right? Wow. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> I didn't even know yeah. they made one on them. Cool. Yeah. So man. who's who's the author or who did that? Ah, uh, who's the author? That's a good question. Rich Low, or is that the publisher? Well, I'll have to. Of... <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to look that up. I just that's I just... cool. You see, you learn something every day. There you go. Yeah, I just look at the <laughs> I just look at the pictures. You know, I'm like, all right, show me some cool pictures. Let's yeah, some, stuff. <laughs> sometimes I've noticed with the biographies, they sometimes go a bit crazy telling you where all the musicians went to school and stuff. Yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know if we really need to know all of that. But right, right. I what mean, was your know, favorite food and whatnot? You know what they like. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it goes a bit too far. We need to know about. Yeah, but anyway, I, I guess I that's in the read... detail. I don't know if you've read uh, People Funny Boy, the Lee Perry biography, but it's like sure. yeah, it's exactly yeah. what you're describing right now. He'll be like, Lee Perry came to work one morning and you know said hi to the maintenance man in the yard. And then the next paragraph is like, the maintenance man was named Hugh, and he was born. And, <laughs> and it goes it on tells like you which pages. parish he was born yeah. and where he went to school and whether he was right. good at sports or not. Yeah, no, it's really yeah. awesome as like a source of info. Like, But if yeah, sometimes you're like, all right, let's yeah, where yeah. the Congo. I mean, that's like a lawyer's mind. Yeah, a little bit too much detail. <laughs> so, so, so Fatty, man, there's so much stuff that, that I would love to talk to you about, and I just want to jump right in. I don't even know. Man, we got plenty of time, so fire away, brother. Hit good, man. Good, good, good. It's just it's just us three. No one else is watching. Trust me. No, I'm joking. There, the, the, there's fans out there, and if you guys listening and watching, um, feel free to put questions in the, the chat section um, for Fatty, and we'll, we'll uh, ask away. Um but yeah, man, I, like I said, I've been a big fan of, of what you do, uh, you know, producing and engineering and, uh, you got some, some dope just sessions and interviews and kind of workshop stuff online. You know, I, I produce and, and do music myself. Devin, uh, does music. We're, we're all in the whole scene, the stuff. And I just want to tell you, you know, jumping in to, um, I know it's cliche and I know it's just the, the question to ask, but I really do want to know, like, how did you get your start in reggae music? Um, well, listening wise, uh, okay, yeah, listen, there's two two things. One is listening yeah. and one is work. Basically, when I was at school, one of my buddies started playing drums and I started to play bass and we were hanging out and jamming and so on. And his mom had, had been, um, was an art teacher and she'd, she'd done her studies in London. And I guess this must have been in the 70s and she had a, a Jamaican boyfriend. And he said, oh, I was going through my mom's records. You've got to bear in mind, this is like late 90s. I mean, late right. 80s, sorry. Late, yeah, late 80s, like 89, 90 kind of thing. And he said, like, oh, I was going through my mom's vinyl and I found these records that's just got drums and bass on them and occasionally a bit of vocal kind of thing. And he said, they're weird, you know, because he liked Led Zeppelin and Cream and Stone Roses or whatever, you know. Right. And I was like, wow, that sounds cool. He's like, yeah, you can have them. <laughs> and I was like, okay, because we used to trade records and comics and stuff, and you know, just like you do. Right. So next thing, a few days later, he pops up and he gives me these four albums. One of them was the dub of Israel Vibration, same song, the one nice. by Fat Man. Ooh, I don't know yeah. if you know that, but that's yeah, a killer album. Wicked. Really, really cool. The dubs are crazy good. Um, the second album was Joe Gibbs, Chapter Two. Yep. And then Mark uh, Garvey's Ghost. By burning spear and then mm. something else which i can't quite remember right now but definitely those three you know in the kind of handful that i had and then i just that was it and i'm it kind of for me for me once i started to explore dub after that i found it a bit disappointing because i already had three of the best dub albums already if you see what i mean <laughs> it's yeah. downhill from there yeah not downhill but i was just <laughs> like oh that's okay but it's not as good as joe gibbs or oh, it's not as good as fat man or it's not as good as burning spear so obviously then the tubby comes in and the the, the lee perry stuff and it's funny you right. mentioned the the book about lee perry but when i left when i basically I left home at 17 moved to london and started working in the studio and I, need, I needed somewhere to stay. And one of the other engineers said, oh, there's a there's a room in my house available. You can rent that. And it just that so happened to be the house, and it belonged to Dave Katz, oh, the, wow. the reggae autobiographer and DJ. Yeah. Right. So I was like 17, 16, 17, and I'm living in Dave Katz's house, except he's upstairs. And he's playing Lee Perry all day because he's a Lee Perry maniac. 
and um, I just got to, to heal this Lee Perry all the time. So eventually, I was kind of had the courage to knock on his door and say, hey, you know, wow, whatever you were playing, you know, what was that? And can I have a copy on cassette kind of thing? And, right. and then, wow, he started loading me up with super rare Lee Perry that I'd never heard of. So that was kind of, those. I remember those two early moments were from a lis listening perspective. Right. And then from a working perspective, basically, <laughs> it was a funny thing. It was basically a cool, super cool American producer, a guy called Jimmy Gray. And he was married to an English woman, English Jamaican woman. And he was often booked the studio that I was working in. I always engineered for him and so on. And one day he just said to me, oh, I think he'd really like my, my brother-in-law. And he's got a studio down in Brixton. Remember, Brixton is the other Jamaican neighborhood that I told yeah. you about. He said, you should, you should go down there. And so I did. And I didn't realize it was basically Brixton's number one reggae studio at the time called Lion Music. And Roy Shirley was in there. Yellow Man would pop by. Um, wow. It was Little Roy, Twinkle Brothers, Dub Judah, Junior Delgado, Pablo Gad. All these wow. kind of guys were hanging out there all the time. And everyone kept, almost every other session, people disconnected stuff and then didn't reconnect it. So the next engineer would come in and freak out. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was just getting called in there in the evenings. You know, they'd call me and say, oh, it's not working. Please come down. And I'd be like, okay, listen, after work tonight, I'll pass through. Kind right. of thing. And then I'd reconnect the tape machine or, you know, sort out the patch bay or whatever was going on. And just started hanging out. And, you know, so that was a long time ago. And obviously, Dub Judah plays bass with me. I don't know if you check out some of the credits, but you'll see he's plays bass for me. And wow, I've known him for so long, you know. It's amazing. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. I love him. And the mad thing is, Roy Shirley, I didn't even know who Roy Shirley was. I, I was just like, wow, this old guy is so talented. And he was kind of, when the guys at the studio were doing live shows every now and again, Roy, Shir Roy Shirley would do a set in his crazy kind of magician's outfit. Yeah, uh -huh. this kind of crazy, Green. <laughs> like, uh, I think With it was blue jacket. or purple, I remember. It was like a crazy crazy magician's thing with a big collar and a cape and <laughs> and he'd come out like that looking kind of crazy but singing like Roy Shirley does in his am, am, amazing style and really deep songs and I remember helping him on many recordings and I just didn't even know who he was which is crazy now when I think back because after he passed away that's when I realized because all of this come out and I was like oh this is who Roy Shirley is and I had no idea Right. So it was a bit crazy. That's um, that. Oh, go so on, yeah, man. that was well, just that was kind of part of it. And at the same time, I started working for this record label called Acid Jazz that were doing loads of these f funk kind of bands like Jamira Choir and the Brand New Heavies and so on. And the boss of Acid Jazz was a was a big reggae seventies reggae fan too. And he said to me, "Ah, oh, if we can bring back the funk, we can bring back the reggae too." And I was mm -hmm. like, "Okay." And he signed Dred Flimstone from California. And uh, he signed Gregory Isaacs for an album. And that's wow. how I got to work with Gregory Isaacs um, and meet uh, Mafia and Flux, um, nice. Mikey Campbell, and all those kind of guys. And obviously Gregory as well, <laughs> which was good fun. You know? It was good. It was cool. Heck yeah. Jeez. That's yeah. It, It's crazy that you um, bring up Roy Shirley and David Katz in the same story because – um, we actually, the band that I was in for years called the expanders, we backed, um, Roy Shirley in 2008 for what ended up being his last show. He passed away, uh, two weeks later. And, but David Katz was managing Roy Shirley at that time. And so, uh, I was corresponding with David a lot. And then we, we did a lot of correspondence after that, right. When Roy passed, cause he passed the news on to us and there was a little tribute out here. So that's a, that's a crazy, that's a crazy connection, but that's cool that you got to, to work with, uh, with Roy, man, he's one of the best. Yeah, he was he was incredible. How he did harmonies and his his wow, his voice and I mean, he, yeah, very very special. And um, actually, kind of now, whenever I see Roy Shirley stuff, I've got a nice collection. I always just buy it. <laughs> it's funny, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. He, it's kind of like I'm I'm reversing. You know, the more he's actually a hard guy to find his music. It's not easy, especially mm -hmm. the early tunes. Yep. Can be very very expensive and very good but yeah, you know, we, 
we have a question here from our boy uh, Chris Brennan in the comments that I want to bring up right now. Big up, Chris. Uh, yeah. I know he's a uh, big Prince Fatty fan, and he asks, Fatty, what was it like collaborating with Mad Professor on the Clone Theory album? Who was on the controls? Did you both have hands on the console? Okay. Well, no. Um, he did his albums in his studio. I'm sorry. He did his mixes in his studio uh, at Arewa in uh, South London, and I did mine. At, at my studio at the time in Brighton, but um, I've known Prof for a long time, you know, and I uh, love him dearly. Super cool. We did a nice tour after after that album together, and a uh, while wow, got to go to Martinique and Guadeloupe, and nice. we went to Brazil and, and, wow. and, and what, Europe, and so yeah, it was it was good fun traveling with the Mad Professor. You know, he's a real international gallivanter. He he <laughs> goes he goes far. <laughs> from you know japan australia and chile and all these things so i was like yo prof man he's like okay man and i said well why don't we do like a kind of dub album together then we can hit the road right and he was like sure let's do it so and he uses okay. horseman as well don't forget on uh horseman has been playing drums for mad professor since he was at school wow yeah amazing so, stuff man he i mean he works with you in so many so many levels yeah, yeah. And, and well horse horseman's my brother man i love him dearly he's like my older brother really that's the to be truth the truth be told yes. so we're you know and we've been working together a long time long hats time. off hats off to the whole like drum drop stuff and all the stock stuff you do with style scott and and horseman oh, cool, because man. geez i mean dude trust me everyone i talk to you know in the reggae scene in los angeles when you're a musician that's just right that's needed it's like needed. It's a void that you filled. And I mean, I've, I've used the track. People use the track. It's just like for any, it's not only are they great and, and, and they sound great and the production's great and the recordings are great, great musicians. And I, I haven't heard, you know, um, of Horseman and, and really got to hear him um, until, I, you know, I started checking out your stuff. So he's a just killer on the drums, man. Yeah, that's it. Well, you know, just, uh, well, uh, let me finish off just with Horseman to let you know. But yeah, because obviously Horseman drummed for Prof since he was like 16. So, mm -hmm. and some of the other musicians, all we all kind of work together. It's a small scene. So, some of the, the you know, Black Steel, who's been playing guitar for my professor for years, um, occasionally if my guitarist Cash isn't available, would come and help me out in sessions and so on. So, we've all known each other a long time. Sometimes if I'm in London and I need a studio a few hours to voice, Marcy Griffiths down to voice at Mad Professors, for example, to do things, and you know it's good. It's family vibes. It's good, and uh, yeah, and Joe and, and you know everybody come out and the whole crew. It's good. So I know, I know, uh, you know, I think he's he's been recording all through this kind of COVID lockdown. So I think you're gonna hear some good music from nice. the professor too. I'm sure. <laughs> so I know yeah. Horseman has been going down there a couple times a week. So I know he must have a whole heap. The rhythms now beautiful so yeah so uh, yeah going back to the drum drops thing i started out that because i just love recording drums so it's always the in the sessions and i think it was the one place where as well often the not the super heavyweight producers or whatever but maybe in sometimes can i say this the maybe there was opportunity to express yourself with a drum sound whereas in other areas you couldn't maybe the producers would be very fixed on the mm -hmm. bass sound that they had or the keyboard sound or vocal sound but perhaps they weren't really they didn't really perceive much on the drum sound other than it being ambient or dry or something like that that'd be the only reference you get right so i, I really got into kind of expressing myself trying to get interesting or vibey you know drum drum tracks for people and then that's kind of how i got to meet lots of the good drummers so like star scott i met him through working with adrian sherwood from on you sound and uh, guys, yeah, like Keith LeBlanc from the Sugar Hill Gang, people like that. So, heck uh, yeah, Ho Horseman I met at the studio in Brixton. He was like the number one drummer there. So we we met before we worked together as Prince Fatty and Horseman, just in a drummer engineer uh, kind of relationship. He done put my studio to do a an album by a band called <clears throat> called the Amerix. Mm. And uh, yeah, That's wow, as soon as as soon as he heard his drums come back, he was like, yo, I love, this is my studio. Okay, from now on, you know, I want to record my drums here. Yeah. I was like, I guess that was must have been like 2003. So that's okay. a long time ago now. And then we just started doing 
and he's a versatile drummer, so I'd bring him in for soul sessions or pop sessions too. Right. You know, sometimes something needs a little calypso feel, a little tropical feel, whatever. Mm -hmm. Also, just for straight hip hop beats or soul beats, he can do the Al Green kind of vibe. You know, you can see he's, yeah, he's <laughs> totally he's awesome. Man. Yeah, when you, he's very, very fast too. Yeah. You 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 kind of touched on something a little earlier when you're talking about recording for uh, the drum drop stuff. Is it uh, you know, kind of you having the, the freedom to record um in the way you want to record and you know it's fun to record drums, but there was something that you said um online. And like I said, I've watched your stuff like, you know, several times. So it was something that stuck to me, like uh, as someone that records music as well, is, is you mentioned, you know, staying safe, like in the safe zone where, you know, OK, here's your SM57 on the snare and here's, you know, your kind of blueprint for recording. And, you know, Devin and I, when, just when you go to a studio, that's the case more so than not. And I didn't thinking out of the box, like when you said that and, and you know, I was like, yeah, I mean that makes sense. You, I mean, you can do that for other genres, but I, it never really struck me like with reggae music, you know, um, that specifically. I mean, do you still like follow those guidelines, do, or have you yeah, formed a blueprint well, over time? You know what? I think it's just I like to capture the sound as it is. That's right. I don't tend to, I tend to not record it unless it's the right thing. At least at that moment, how we're feeling. You know, you might change your mind later or whatever. But at that moment, you're sure it's the the right thing so just depends on on style so microphones to me are like instruments so I'd, if i want like a disco hi-hat sound i'd use maybe like a sweeter condenser microphone and it's you know or like a km84 neumann or something like that but if i'm doing like a reggae session i don't want the hi-hat so i want it more mid-rangey really so then i'd choose maybe like a bear an m130 ribbon microphone if you see what I mean. i'd use that mm -hmm. on the hi-hats instead so rather than thinking about eq i wouldn't eq one microphone to sound like another if you see what i mean yeah, uh, yeah sometimes yeah. I, I tend to switch microphones rather than equalize i could yeah i could eq some of the high end out of a km84 and then maybe boost some of the mids a little bit to, but then it, then i'm using an eq so i just switch microphone right um that really came from working in good studios when you had good EQs, okay, but then sometimes when you're working in bad studios and the EQ on the desk was really shit or bad, sorry, then just don't use the EQ at all. Switch the mic. Right. You can say you know, shit all you want. Yeah, say uh, cool, shit more. <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, <laughs> sorry. But, yeah, no if, um, you know, right, right, I, I tend to not equalize. So if, it's, if the sound at source is too bright, I'll change the amp or change the guitar or change the pickup or I'll right. do everything except equalize. I will equalize when I'm mixing a little bit, if you see what I mean. Yeah. When I'm recording drums, I tend to equalize the snare and kick a little bit, but the rest mm -hmm. I tend to leave flat, just down to the mics. Then obviously when I'm mixing, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll tune up a little bit some of the things. But generally, I don't tend to EQ too crazy like that. So that comes from the old school way of working because EQ messes with the phase. So the more you EQ, the more you change the face. So it kind of, I don't know, it comes from that kind of theory. So it's good not to, in principle at least, it's good not to to, to overdo it, if you see what I mean. Totally. And then if yeah. you, what I've learned is as well, with now sometimes some of my friend studios, for example, rather than having like one desk, they might have like two, two preamps from Neve, two from API, and they've recorded like this. But then when I'm hearing back, there's something, I think there's something in the phase relationship. If we're recording drums, I think it's important that all those channels come through the same preamp. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but... I think Not at all. I never I never would think that, about that. <laughs> there's something in that, because I think all the preamp... It's, I get it why people want different tones and so on, but I think you have to be very careful. So now I, I work in this concept. Like the in in my studio, everything's in blocks of eight, eight. So you know all the drums come come through eight channels, and then the the music will go down eight channels, and then the voice will go down another eight channels. Wow. So, but through different line inputs, so it's fine. Or, but they're always. I mean, I've got a more group. Everything is kind of. I keep it all locked together like that. And nice. I, I don't know. It's just how how 
that's where I'm at right now with, <laughs> with some of that. Yeah, yeah. So think, it, yeah. Well, I was just going to say about the oh, drum things. Sorry, yeah. Devin, sorry. No, 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 One please. Thing. But if you're interested with the drums, I don't know if you had a chance to check out the horsemandrums.com. It's Horseman's new website that we've kind of recently started. And uh, this week we've been recording more drums for it. I think there's about 130 more performances that got, are going up there with the 60 or so that are on there. So wow. I think it's good. there's going to be like 200 or so, close to 200 beats. Wow. Yeah. That should be enough to keep <laughs> Cali busy. For yeah. A while. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> Beautiful. I a lot of to ska ask... beats too. Oh, nice. Wicked. Okay, so when it comes to like you mentioned ska, and so I wanted to ask about like um how much experimenting you've done with like mic placement when it comes to drums. Cause to me, you know, I'm kind of a, a novice when it comes to, you know, engineering recording. So this might be um I don't know how what kind of question this is really, but like you know, you listen to Studio One or like even the Skylights before that, and it sounds to my untrained ear that, you know, the the mics were farther away, right, from the drum set. And then you listen to, you know, Style Scott in the early 80s with the Roots Radix, and it sounds like each each drum is like its own in, its own instrument, like a snare or kick, and, you know, it sounds like the placement of the mic has a lot to do with that. And is that something that you've, you know, experimented yeah. with over the years? Okay, so, well, Studio One used old RCA ribbon mics, Mm -hmm. So you know, like the, the ones that you see Elvis use back and and in the in the, the old old studios from the fifties. So and ribbon mics tend to have a more atmospheric sound to them. They're, as you know, they're more open. They pick up the sound from the back mm -hmm. and the front, but they don't have so much high end. So which is kind of nice normally, if you see what I mean. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you, yeah. I think if you want that kind of. More, if you want a more Studio One sound, then you have to work with ribbon microphones more. You won't get that that sound if you're doing it conventionally, like with, um, you know, like dynamic mics, like a 57 on the snare and and all right. these things, and and so close mic'd. For if you want the Studio One sound, you really have to work with three microphones mm -hmm. to catch the drum sound. So you got your kick mic, and then how you spot place two ribbon mics, and one would be kind of snare snare heavy and hi-hat heavy and the other mic would be kind of more tom heavy on the other side you know what i mean yeah and they they just work like that or even one microphone with the kick that's it so right. um, nice. but the ribbon mic is what's giving it the vibe and then they're placing the mix where they i think in those times they've because obviously they were fighting the high end as well they wanted the high end but didn't couldn't really get it too much because obviously all the mics were ribbon mics predominantly in those days see what mm -hmm. i mean yeah so cond condenser mics the tube condenser mics that were available at the time were super super expensive like neumann's they did have some they did have some because uh, i know winston francis told me that they had neumann's at, at studio one as well but they used mm -hmm. those for the vocals oh yeah in nice. fact going back to studio one winston francis told me that um when he was there the when they built the the, the live room at studio one they built it in a hurry and they had this plank of wood that was stuck coming out of the the corner of the ceiling you know and right. it was something to do with how they they built the ceiling and they were supposed to remove all these planks after they'd done the ceiling but they left one of them in f for whatever reason and then they kept it like that they recorded for like a couple of years like that and then one day when they had some spare time cox and dodd said right remove the fucking piece of wood it's ugly and you know we got a few mm -hmm. days downtime and they did that and they said that the sound in the live room was never the same again wow jeez <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and the musicians oh, they couldn't work it out you know and basically it was kind of acting as a crude sound reflector but kind of i guess like diffusing you know so it right. stopped the reflection in that that particular corner but it was strong enough to to change the internal balance of the room it was big enough i guess Oh you man, I mean? it'd be I'm really gonna... interesting to hear, like, to know when they did that, and to hear some, like, some pre wood and post wood recording <laughs> the studio on, like, you know, and just really like hone in on that difference. Um, our buddy Blake Colley, I don't know if you know Blake Colley, uh, Fatty, but he plays drums with the Lions. Uh, he's done some backing with Holly Cook, and he wants to know. He says, "Big up, Fatty. Love all your work, boss." Two questions: uh, What sound device yeah, unit do you? for your syndrome laser effects etc for example the syndromes 
in the Prince Fatty Loopmasters sample set? That's his first question. And then he also uh, wants to know well, how would you originally? Well, yeah, let's go I, do that one first. I got it. Well, I got a few of them. Uh, one of them is like an old, is like the Blue Roland PC2. I usually use that. That's like got a pad on it as well. And then I've got a signer, you know, like the UFO shaped signer, like Shaka uses. Oh, yeah. The, the, like the, so, yeah, the circular. Yeah. That one there, the UFO one. And then I tend to also use analog synths. Uh, for a long time, I, um, I, I'd always have a, like a Korg Monopoly or something that right next to the, or feeding off the patch bay. And then I'd, I'd just send, because it's got a trigger input. So I just, I don't know, send the snare drum to it or the tom to it or some whatever I wanted to to kind of get a vibe from and then self oscillate the synth and then tune it to find exactly the note that I wanted or the attack and release time. Because sometimes the signer, you know, it's cool, don't get me wrong, it's got vibes, but the attack and release stuff is a bit limited. So I don't know, at that time I was, I was a bit obsessed with <laughs> trying to get crazy modulating sounds. Maybe a Marshall time modulator as well on feedback, self oscillating and things like that. Mm. So it sounds like a kind of siren, I guess, but um, it was actually possibly the Marshall time modulator just on feedback. That's a pretty cool machine. I don't know if you know right. that one. That's you, right. you, know, you ever you try that, the Marshall time modulator? No, not at all. Oh, I, yeah, will, I will now. I'm going to try that, yeah. and I'm going to get a piece of wood at Home actually Depot. Expensive. It. <laughs> it's expensive now because people it never used to be, but um, now I see them, people want a lot of money for them, but. I right. think George Moroder, the disco guy, he used to use them. Wow. Yeah. So um, I, I actually randomly got one by accident one time and, and loved it. Very co Yeah, cool machine. Hey, I got to look out for that. You know what's crazy is that, like, uh, you know, Blake had a question, Chris had a question, and these are guys that, you know, we all know. And, and in the L.A. scene, um, you know, a lot of guys, uh, just nerds, just like all of us, and, and – and so I wanted to talk dub music with, with you because, like I said, we could talk to you all day. And I, there's some questions I know that they want answers to. I want answers to your take on some stuff because we admire you and look up to you, Mr. Prince right. Fatty, your fatness. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> for sure, I, you know, I started um, getting into dub and started to do stuff and buying equipment. And, and it's just fun to do, you know, and, and dub out the stuff that you've been recording. Um, but I wanted to know... If, when you okay, so like, what are your go-to effects? Like, as far as your oxes, like, what do you think is overkill? Are you using because you, you do some of the on-the-fly stuff that we've seen online? But do you usually are working with two or three oxes? Do you go four? Do you have like a phaser reverb delay, and I'm gonna do this and that, or do you keep well, it kind of minimal? Uh, okay, now, well, before, the, okay, the older stuff like the Holy Cook here, I was using this old BBC desks that had six orcs and four groups. So usually, I I wouldn't use all six auxes normally, no. But usually maybe uh, like four, you know. So I tend to have one or two the effects that I tend to feedback. Maybe two delay lines. Um, so I tend to have basically I like using a tape machine as my main tape echo, and obviously it's a stereo machine. So I'll use one side channel one for the drums and channel two for the music or the voice or whatever mm -hmm. so it's like eq'd slightly differently so mm. when i'm feedbacking wow. the um, the return of the, the channel one or two there is a slightly different high pass low pass filter combination kind of tweak right. to to suit the echo of the drum and then to suit the echo of the chop so that's when i'm going that's kind of there's usually that kind of thing i don't always it's not always so radically different. It depends on the drum sound, if you see what I mean. But yeah. I've got the capability of of kind of rolling out more bass on, on one echo than, than the other, depending. You know, maybe the drum sound's very fat. So on the on the tape echo, when I'm feeding it back, I have to cut more of the, of the bass out of it. Otherwise, when it's feeding back on itself, it's just like going into self-destruction or whatever, you know? Right. You can't find the sweet spot. So... I know a lot of the time with the echoes, people ask me how you do that, but it's the combination of the high pass and low pass filter kind of cleaning it out. Mm -hmm. you see what I mean? Yeah, so totally. Then, when it's, then it's, when it's feedbacking on itself, it's actually, yeah, feedbacking nicely. Yeah. Too much low frequency buildup or high frequency buildup, if you see what I mean. 
For sure. I mean, yeah. the, the videos you have online, I mean, when you have that feedback, it's just butter. It's like, it's just, it's, you know, when you whereas get it other right, ones yeah. might when be abrasive. Run you know? forever, you know? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so, you know, you have all this old school equipment, right? You got like the Roland Space Echo, the, the Biphase Mutron, the Fisher Reverb, um, the Grampian Reverb. How important is it for you to be using some of that vintage stuff? I mean, is it like... Well, the thing is, you know what? All that old stuff, when I got it, didn't really work properly. So yeah. then you have to have a good technician to sort it out. And then you have to understand all equipment has different impedances. So when you start connecting it together, um, you have to then think, wow, does it sound good or does it sound bad? Oh, it mm -hmm. sounds thin. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it sounds thin, it's maybe not the machine that sounds bad. It's the impedance that's mismatched. Oh. So sometimes, I, like in the early days, wow, man, I got rid of equipment because I didn't know what I was doing. And when I think back now, I kick myself. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Right. Yeah, yeah, I was so, so stupid. So oh, it's, it's, you, it's like, exactly, you got rid yeah. of something because you thought it didn't work, but, but I, now you... No, realize. it it worked, but I was just too stupid. Like even base. I mean, I remember I had these Telefunken U73B compressors that now like 15,000 bucks or whatever, but at <laughs> the time I'd got them for like a thousand pounds, you know, wow. but you know, I, I just didn't know what I was doing basically. So what, what's up with that? I was, what's I was up? too young, you know, <laughs> you totally. yeah, what's, yeah, up with yeah. the, what's up with the Fisher reverb, man? Is it like, okay, you it, have to it, mo modify it, it, that. Do you? Because I mean, Chris Brennan, the gentleman who commented, I mean, myself, I actually had bought one, used it and I sold it because it just, I, I got like a Furman instead, but, because it was just too low, right? So you have to modify it, you said? Yeah, you have to mod that. And usually, uh, yeah, basically the Fisher's got, got different. It was designed for an organ as well. So those things actually were designed to, to stick on. It was an optional extra, I believe, for like a Hammond organ. Yeah, you could find them so, in Hammond organs, yeah. That's right. That's why I think that's the principle why they were mainly designed. So people would take them and hack them and mod them and so on. Uh -huh. So... Um, if you want to interface that, like I got a good buddy of mine, Westfinger out in France. He, oh, yeah. he, he does a modification on, um, on Fisher space expanders and stuff. So it, he basically sorts it out, but he puts a transformer on the input and hooks it up so that then it will, you know, you can s set it to a patch bay and it sounds cool. He, he does so the high pass filters too, right? Westfinger does that. He does. High yeah. Pass filters, yeah. He does. Yeah. Actually, yeah, he does. He does. Funny enough, every time I say to him, "Oh, a couple of my buddies want it," I goes, "Oh, I'm sorry, I sold that of the last batch." <laughs> I know they're flying out. He's doing a good job. What What are your thoughts um, on that high pass filter? That tubby high pass filter? Like, do you have? I got three of them, three three pairs. Wow! So that that tells you I love them. You know. Right. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've tried all all the common high pass, low pass filter combinations, but I have Yuri ones as well, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, obviously, for the for the kind of tubby sound, it is the the, the Altec filter that is the one, you know. Right, right, yeah. Because it's got a, you... such a very sharp frequency to it; it's very particular. Yeah. Could you maybe like explain for some of the people who might be listening and aren't so versed in you know, in in some what some of these effects do? Like you know, like myself, I'm not okay. as an expert. Well, the high, as think project, of the high, but, pass, yeah, the high pass. The yeah, low pass that? thing is a wah wah crudely. It's like a wah wah that you can kind of adjust but it's, yeah you know um so rather than with your foot tubby was if he moves the filter the, the filter quickly then it sounds like a wah wah almost if you see what i mean is that so is that the sound on like some of the like flying symbol stuff where you'd hear like the yes <laughs> yeah correct all right cool exactly yeah and then later jammy used to use that as well scientists use that mm -hmm. obviously when they were mixing the tubbies even Lee Perry, when he went to do mixes at Tubby's, would use it too. Nice. Um, but it does have a very particular vibe to it. So I got three of them, and then I kind of tend to try it on everything as always. <laughs> but it doesn't always mm -hmm. work on everything. It's funny. Mm -hmm. right. It's very reliant on the frequencies that are going in. So mm -hmm. I think how Tubby was using it on the groups as well was clever because... He had a high pass and a low pass. So I think he would use different channels on different things. Mm -hmm. you see what I mean? Yeah. So maybe on the keyboard he would he would cut all the high frequencies out and then with the other with the other filter he'd be, be 
you know, cutting out on the on the hi hat, doing the squawking sound on right. the flying symbol, like you said, for mm-hmm. the aggravators or whatever. So I guess that's how, and it, in a way, it's like a crude imitation of a crossover. If you think of a crossover in a speaker, I think that's why Tubby thought like that because he come from a speaker and sound mm-hmm. system mindset. So remember those guys. They like the effect. They they already could cut the high frequency on the sound systems in those days and just let the bass rumble anyway. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? The European or American DJs weren't doing that. See totally. what I mean? If you were like a disco DJ in San Francisco, a soul DJ, and you did that, they'd fire you, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> Imagine you're you out. playing some big, some big Motown records, and then you go, yeah, forget the vocals, and you just, right. you know, on the on the PA or whatever, go to the crossover and take all the mids and high frequencies out. If you mm-hmm. did that, they think you're crazy. Whereas oh, the Jamaicans sure, sure. did that all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah, they used to just pull the cable out. You understand? Right, right. So once in the 70s, once the studios, because I think in the, the the early 60s and late 60s sound systems didn't really have tweeters mm. like the 70s ones did. So as soon as the, the, the modern or the 70s kind of tweeters come in on the sound systems, that's when they they had that extra high end, mm-hmm. so that then they started wanting that, and I think that's why the yeah they could use that kind of effect. But I think the systems before that they probably didn't have much after five K. You understand? Right, right, so, right. Yeah, makes so much sense. All that kind of, yeah, they wouldn't have that high, that high thing. So I think the combination of the tweeters landing on the scene, and then Tubby realizing he can do that. And then, wow, he just blew everyone's minds with that for sure. <laughs> so, when are you going to write a write a book? Because I feel like I feel like you should be writing a book on this because all this information that you have, it's like, wow. Well, I don't know. <laughs> or something. I, I don't I'll know. Let you know, I'm not very good at writing. <laughs> oh, okay, well, forget the book. The the, the more videos love, you do and, and post them, cats. the better. The more videos, yeah, yeah. the better. Um, do you ever do you ever um sit down? You're gonna do you're gonna you're gonna do a dub, and do you go okay? I'm going to purposely take the route of a black art dub or, you know, do something where it's like a channel one thing scientist, or, or do you always just do you and, and not think about that? Um, well, I try. the thing is the equipment. Sometimes I think people over value the equipment. The personality is hmm. more important or the person and the musicians because how Lee Perry uses the biphase. I've never heard anyone else <laughs> use one. I agree. In myself I agree. included, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the interesting thing, again, going back to Lee Perry studio, the one should know, is because Errol Thompson's people, Errol Thompson, sorry, not his people, Errol Thompson himself wired that studio up for Lee Perry, mm-hmm. and he's a master engineer. So if you know, uh, yeah, I mean, Errol Thompson's one of my favorite. Oh, yeah, Errol T. Yeah. yeah. So he plugged up and wired up and built Lee Perry studio. I mean, not built the equipment, obviously, but set it all up, wired it mm-hmm. up, and hooked it up for him. So, so it sounded good. So then, like I said, with the biphase again, often people uh, just plug into it. They don't realize it's an effects pedal. So you need like a reamp pedal at the at the beginning and a and a DI on the output if you want to interface it with a mixing desk properly. See what nice. I mean? Wow. Totally. If you plug it straight in out of the mixing desk, straight in, it doesn't sound right. It's thin and, and yeah, the, that's wow. right. Wow. So those, those kind of things. So Lee right. Perry, Lee Perry was wise, and he got Errol Thompson to set him up, and off he went. And, that's you know. cool. <laughs> so I, and, do you uh, when when you're um, do you always do on the fly dubs, or do you ever find yourself doing something like for a client where? it needs to be very particular and it's like more of an automated thing and you go section by section. Mm, yeah, I can dub in sections. Sure. And, and then I might not move on until I got it right. So the, the beginning, sometimes I can take 20 minutes rehearsing just the intro on the first, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe minute or so. And then after that, I'll just vibes out and mm-hmm. then I'll, I'll, I'll try and reverse engineer, reverse engineer it. So I do the opposite. So if I'm starting without the drums and maybe with the, the bass or, you know, the chops or whatever, then the next mix will be the complete opposite. I'll start with the drums and bring the chops and stuff in later. Mm-hmm. And I tend to like it live, yeah. If I'd start 
trying to do it half live and half computerized, I get right. I trapped out. And I don't, <laughs> you know. So yeah, I I might on vocals I might just erase or mute certain lines that I don't want. But I still keep tend to keep more of them in in mm -hmm. case in that moment I want to bring it in. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I would say it's it's ninety five percent live, you know. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's the only way because the mistakes. Sometimes the mistakes are give you take you somewhere interesting. See what I mean? For sure. Of course. So yeah. yeah, you know it's a bit dark. You mute something, and you go, oh no, <laughs> right? It's not good. Like, and you go, actually, yeah, that's cool. I should cut the bass there. That's like and life. Then you, and then you do it. So and uh, so it's, yeah, it's nice. Sometimes a more complicated stuff like Horseman's done mixes with me where. As well, he'd be dubbing up some bits or doing some cuts on the drums, and I'm dubbing the vocal, and then we swap chairs. It's funny. Wow. Mm. Wow. So, you know, and then we did. Cause, <laughs> and, you know, and um, yeah, many stories those guys. Sometimes there'd be three, four guys behind the desk. Not, wow. not on my sessions with Osman, but on other people's. Dennis Bavel told me, like, on his stuff, wow, the drummer would be doing mutes on the desk for his drums, and, you know, the bass player would be doing the bass mutes. And he'd be there dubbing up the vocal and the other stuff. Wow. Because if the tracks, you know, if there was a lot of mutes to be done on the desk, you needed fingers and right. automation. See what I mean? So right. it's like, yo, Redren, cut the bass there at the second verse or, you know, cut the bass on the intro and bring it in halfway through the first verse or whatever. Right. So, so you need musicians that know where their own parts are coming in and they become your automation service. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> So yeah, it's um, cool. I, I had a, uh, you know, listening to your music, I just had to ask you, is it fair to say that around 2012, because I mean, prior to that, you know, you had Return of the Gringo, Super Size, you know, the survival of the fattest was the first time I heard any of your stuff. And so the production there, I was just loving the organ sounded dope. Everything was cool. And then it wasn't for like, better or for worse it was just different but like around 2012 um the the sound was a little different is it fair to say that like it yeah yeah well we were just using different places and different okay. rooms so um the at the beginning yeah yeah it's just different different studios different places okay. um then uh, i guess the musicians kind of changed too Mm. Um, Horseman sort of kind of really was in, from there on in became the 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 engine if you like on drums you know got you got you and then uh, the studios kind of developing as well with more equipment got and then, you um, just getting bigger and more adventure trying to push for better better sound on the sound system and more hey more weight you know that makes sense more it was more of a stereo of a stereo but thing that I, I was think, hearing. Uh, like on the survival of the fattest, you know, like you, I'm a big Jackie Mitu fan. So I was just like, wow, okay, let's put some of the Jackie Mitu vibes into this, into the organ vibes and, and everything. And then it just kind of, we, because with Osman as well, we got more into the sound system. Then we just started making more and more. Gotcha. I guess we were looking for the same kind of weight as our channel one records or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. Then right. comes from that. Yeah. Makes sense. And then, trying to do interesting versions too because many you know in the sound system it's nice to have different cuts than everybody else mm -hmm. so then i started thinking okay you know let's mix it up and always have plenty of surprises up our sleeves totally so, I mean, so it's kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. it's cool um, we you know at that time i had my studio anyway so we'd be recording all the time literally every week nice so That's i awesome. still got wow well, i still got many many unreleased songs from that period yeah that's great, man. That's that's something I really just like one of the one of the worst things about this whole COVID situation is just like get, getting any kind of like studio momentum like that with a group, you know, with a group of people. Just, I, I really I really miss that, man. Just being with a band in the studio for a long period of time. I worry about. Yeah, but I worry about the drummers not being able to practice. <laughs> You're right. Man. So true. Yeah. yeah. And you know everybody as well because if you don't, you know, if you sit around too much, it's yeah, man, it's not good. That's yeah, true. I didn't think about that. Drummers you can't be practicing so, in your in your apartment. That's right. You need you need stamina, you know. And yeah. drumming is a physical thing, so if you're not doing it all the time, 
I can imagine everyone's first few sessions are going to be pretty pretty sluggish. Right. Wow. Right. That's right. So drummers, you need to get back to like doing home exercises real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No <laughs> kidding. Things yeah. will get better. It'll be okay. You know, I believe that things will be better. And um, you know, just be ready for when it does. Right. So right, do your press ups sure. in the morning, and go on with that. Most definitely. For real. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's all cool. But yeah, the dub the dub thing is it's nice, but the if it's professional, it's not so nice. And what I mean by that is the environment. So the sometimes if it's a, for I don't know people come to me and say, oh, can you make a dub from this? And I think, wow, well, yeah, but it's not really going to be that interesting. So then I just don't don't do it. <laughs> so you got to find you go. things. I think you got to if it's not easy as well. So that's the creativity in, in the respect in finding a very different B-side mix. So, you know, like earlier, you guys talked about impact. Mm -hmm. How if you didn't like the A-side, you'd love the B-side because the dub would be heavy. You'd have big yeah. youth on there or something. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing. So when you have that kind of mindset, you go, okay, the vocal version's like this, cool, but it isn't. What are we going to do with the, how are we going to flip it? So then, then that's, that's where the challenge is. Is, is there like a on my own stuff? I can spend days on it, like literally three days, just reconstructing wow. it, and then I'll do the dub. But in my own studio, I can do that when I'm in Thailand. It's okay. But if you're somewhere where it's costing like six hundred a day, then everyone goes crazy. Right. So then that's, uh -huh. that's what I mean about the professional thing. So that's not good right. then. <laughs> you see what I mean? For yeah. sure, so, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, was it a challenge to dub music that wasn't necessarily reggae? I I know that. I was listening to the um, in the kingdom of dub. Is it fair to say? I mean, there's tracks on there that that are not yeah, reggae that's, tracks. That's right. Yeah, that's like a jazz kind of fusion thing. So, right. yeah, that was good fun. Yeah, definitely. I love that. I really. There's some few cuts on that. I really, I really love. Nice. Yeah, I was digging it just because it's um, something different. You don't hear jazz and all that soul being, you know, dub. That's it. It can it can be done. I think if you have the space and and the mood. Uh, ben Ben often from Nostalgia 77 would come and mix in my, my studio so after we do the mix uh, yeah I'd just have fun or I'd be like oh check out my new tape echo and I'd just pop like a big echo on one of his, his solos on one of his tracks or something and he'd be like wow one day we should really do that to the jazz and dub it out mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. and then somehow we did so I kind of re-edited some of his material overdubbed some percussion and then off we went. That was it. Nice, Sometimes man. You, you need you need the elements to be able to break down, as you know, so that then you got got enough to create something. So it's good, right? When you have the freedom to edit the song, then that's good. So uh, you can kind of find a find a new dimension for it. Most definitely. Yeah. Let's, um, yeah. Shanice, let's actually, Shanice is one of my toughest dub critics. Just to let you ah, know. She's that's just exactly. In. <laughs> oh, how and, beautiful. Well, yeah, that's... so I'm, up to, I'm under even more pressure now when I make for my dubs because <laughs> Shanice is a real dub head. She loves it. And she's like, no, I'm not sure about that one. I'm like, oh, my God. Well, well why, don't we, why, don't we bring, <laughs> why don't we bring Shanice in now? I think yeah, it's... you know what? Maybe that's a good time. Yes. Yeah, Welcome, Shanice. Shanice, yes. Let me... Um... Okay. Hi, everyone. Come on, hey. Roger and Devin. How you doing? <laughs> Let me just give you a quick. Can you hear the headphones, okay? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Yes, hello. Hello. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hello. Here. How are you guys? We're Good. Great. How are you doing? You? Thank this you for is being Roger on the, on the left and Devin on the right. Okay. okay hello, guys. Thank hey. you, Roger and Devin, for having How us. How you doing? Congratulations yeah. on on the new music. I'm really, really enjoying Black Rabbit, and yeah, um, thank you I mean, so much. the video just got released, right? Because I saw the video last night. Yeah, so right. it was released yesterday. Yeah, cool, yeah cool. the 25th. Right. Yeah, very, very exciting stuff. Um, the video was definitely a um, turning point for both of us, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because we'd never really done that before. So obviously you have the enthusiasm of being a novice. And then we right. realized, wow, this is really time consuming. And like three weeks later, we were like, oh, when's it going to end? It's not like making music, you know, videos. <laughs> well, right. we think if we spend a day or two on a song, we think, well, this, wow, that was really long, you know. Mm -hmm. these, these, the video, the poor video guys, wow, they spent like five days just doing some animation. Wow. And it's like, wow, you got to have the patience of a Shaolin monk 
to <laughs> to to be a video guy. My, I mean, you know, it was fun. We loved it, but loved it a lot. Loved it wow. a lot. But it was a learning curve. Big learning for, curve, yeah. Was, yeah, for definite. I mean, one thing I definitely learned that I didn't know before mm-hmm. was how much frames were in a second. And if right. you think about that with animation, they have to draw for each frame in each second. So a min- um, a video is four minutes long. Wow, they've just got so much to do if it's a full animation video. So I have so much respect for people that edit, animate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. To me, I'm something to them. no, no, like I have no visual, visually artistic talent whatsoever. So that kind of stuff is just like magic to me. I'm like, ah, oh, this I don't even understand. Me too. And I love cartoons. You see what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was, and so now, now it's actually made me appreciate it even more, kind of thing. Because before, maybe some, like, oh, you like this animation? Like, oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. And actually, no, it was really good. And the poor guys must have been there like three months doing it. Right, I realize that now. Yeah, yeah. Just to make one Smurfs cartoon. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Wow, that's a lifetime's work. Some of those things. <laughs> and then, if you think about, if you think back to the old, super old cartoons, like the Japanese cartoons of the eighties or seventies, or even Walt Disney before that, that that was all done by hand. Mm-hmm. So sure. they really, they 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 were at it for years. My my mom yeah, used to yeah. work for uh, my mom used to work for Disney Studios and we've she's she's still got some like Donald Duck frames. We've got this one up yeah. in our hallway. It's, oh, it's brilliant! Duck. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Good. Well, we love that, you know. So, yeah. mm-hmm. Even though I know Walt Disney is supposed to be a bad guy, right? <laughs> we won't mention you know, that. Like, every, no, everybody, no Disney, everybody's right? a bad guy. Everyone is a bad guy. Well, you got to be t- you got to be tough to be the boss. That's the truth, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, right. James Brown said, "I paid the cost to be the boss." boss yes, yes. That's well, Donald so true, Duck, right? Donald Duck was a good guy, though. So that's what we focus on. Yeah, I like Donald that's Duck so too. True. He was cool. <laughs> and, so the, did... and the three little ones. Sorry, I was just going to ask, what did you think of the video? Because honestly, I... it's it's come from our imagination let's put it that way <laughs> i i thought it was great right because it, I mean, yeah. it started it, it, the way it started and ended with you like you know lying down with the book and uh i think that it was a real nice blend of like the animation that you guys are talking about and then you know obviously you're the character in there and so um it, yeah it lent him it lent itself really good to the music because i'm a big fan of the song so yeah. Th- yeah. i mean quickly I, i'm i'm the kind of guy that'll play out a song and then just like be tired of it and I think I'll be tired of Black Rabbit in like a week because yeah. I'm playing. Yeah. I'm just playing it over and over. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's you. one of those Thank tunes. You. <laughs> you know, um, me and Devin DJ, and so like it's. I'll look at a tune sometimes in perspective of when you're playing it at a club. Like there's a certain point where you want to wheel up. Like I don't know why. It's just like I'll be listening to right. myself and be like, "No, wheel, wheel, wheel," because it's so dope. And like, you know, for me, it's um, you you say like you know, uh, one pill makes you larger, the other one makes you small. And like right there, it's just heavy. It's like rewind, rewind, you know. So and it's that one makes of those me tunes. So happy. <laughs> no, for sure. And I was telling Fatty earlier that um, I'm a sucker for like composition and chord changes. You know, I mean, if you can go A minor to E minor all day, and I'm sure it'll be a heavy song. But when you guys do this, don't knock the you, A minor to E minor, Raj. <laughs> go on. Devin hates it when I knock A minor to E minor. He just hates it. It's a favorite, his favorite chords. <laughs> but when you guys, you know, start off with the minor vibe. And then change to that more, you know, melodic major thing. That's where I'm like, yeah, you know, it definitely triggers something. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's, it's a clever song. And actually the the parts are very clever too. The vocal, the guitar hook, and yeah, even the original, the drum roll. It's a very mm-hmm. creative record, man. Very, yeah. So yeah, Most it's great slick, the singer. It's got incredible technique. She definitely was a hard one to follow. That's for wow. sure. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I think Shanice deserves props because I, you know, when yeah. we pop out, I go, oh, how about this one? And it's like I'm going across five decades, four decades, and right. very different styles. You know, like an old right. style, like a 1960 style, like Fever or Laverne Baker. And then I'm like, oh, do this 80s vibe with Tom Brown, and oh, mm-hmm. how about 1969? And so you know, I think it's it's quite, it's fun. I think your karaoke experience is paid off. <laughs> karaoke how dare you karaoke bars smashing i I love it i love it like chinese on is a jukebox is a like horseman too is like a human jukebox she Mm. knows like three thousand songs that's amazing i think that's just from loving music and listening and having to perform it all the time you know for sure i don't know how you do it 
But some people have that brain for it, you know? My mom is like that, and I get a little bit of that from her. It's like lyrics. You know, you hear a song, and, like, if you like it, and you're listening to it, and it, like, it, it, it touches you, then, like, you kind of, like, the second time you listen to it, you already know a lot of the lyrics, and you remember it forever. Some people have that jukebox brain, so that's cool that you do. I, I always find it with the, um, it's the intros. So, um, I don't know if you guys have heard Take Me As I Am, but that intro there, I think it's, Oh yeah, recognizable. So when you're trying to remember songs, mm -hmm. I think it's really useful to use musical cues to remember. Um, so yeah, sometimes I'll just hear an intro and I'll be like, "What's the next verse?" and I'll just sing it without even realizing. Right. So it's it's um it's kind of been built in in you as well. Yeah, like you said, natural comes naturally. Yeah, like you or like one line. You're like you're like, do I know the lyrics to this song? And then you sing the first line, and then you just yeah, that makes you remember the yeah. second line and. By the end, you're like, oh, I do. I do know that whole song. Well, who knew? <laughs> yeah, that, that song in particular, the one you mentioned, uh, Shanice, is the, um, Take Me As I Am. I mean, yeah. that's a funky tune. I love that era of reggae, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, that rock steady, rock steady, you know, that kind of funky. Yeah. It's just a certain kind of thing that gets everyone moving on the dance floor. I think you, you, you perform it well. And the one thing I noticed with that, too, is that, you know, hearing, um, when I heard you, uh, I think, in the Viper Shadow, you did some stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that Trouble song, it's Trouble, yeah, correct? Yeah, Deep Sleep okay. and Trouble on the Viper right. Shadow. Yeah, and in the, the Trouble Viper song, it's like your voice is just so like hypnotizing kind of vibe, you know? And then boom, you come in to uh, Take Me As I Am, and it's just like funky, let's get moving. So that's what I really, that stuck out to me is I'm like, man, she could just sing it all, you know? Like, Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. For real. <laughs> For real. Um, thank you very much. I do appreciate that. It's I, it's definitely is a hard one to do, but I do feel each song has a voice, and I don't mm -hmm. really know any other way to explain that. And I think it's just about knowing the song enough to find the voice that sits with it right. So even though it is, they're all my voice. It's singing it different tech with. Um, different techniques so technically you might sing a song um, with more vibrato or um, a bit more of a, a deeper tone than you would with another song that needs a lighter tone so it's just all about kind of finding the voice of the song basically mm -hmm. so yeah I really enjoy it I love it I do nice. See, on the, on the sound system, often we're springing songs or if we show up places, we do things. So, uh, yeah, there's, we often have a sort of, always have a few simple spontaneous ideas. So it could be anything from Janis Joplin or like the model by Kraftwerk was a good example of that. Because when we go to Germany, we used to play that just for the Germans, if you wow. see what I mean, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And stuff like that. <laughs> so it's just always... It's always good to have things like that up your sleeve. So, oh yeah, for sure. I think, um, yeah, we got to, to have fun with the, all the different vibes, definitely. And Chinese, I think, somehow, yeah, translates it into her own little unique way. Find, like she said, she finds her pocket within that tune, and then just it, out it pops. You know, mm -hmm. sound systems definitely helped with practice, though. That's like I've, the ultimate karaoke, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, just being able to be spontaneous, sing whatever comes to your mind. Right. And when you're you singing, know? maybe for a singer, if they're, they're maybe a regular uh, singer doesn't practice singing songs in different keys or with different grooves, with different feels or tempos. But on the sound system, sometimes the singers yeah. have been, it's yeah. like, oh, fit that song onto this. Right. And wow. And, you know, so some people have a crazy skill set and can do that. And suddenly, you know, like, uh, you know, we, we what did we mash up? Well, uh, the last one that we've been doing is like Janis Joplin. It's been fun. But over the wow. boxing, boxing boxing rhythm, rhythm yeah. by Cornel right, Campbell. Right. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. So, you know, you don't remember the Mercedes Benz um, by Janis Joplin. What's the song called? Uh, oh, Lord. Yeah, Mercedes yeah, Benz. Yeah, Mercedes yeah. Benz. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, sorry. Over the boxing yeah. rhythm. That's tight. Over, that's yeah, yeah. So, and it shouldn't really work, but somehow <laughs> you've made it work. It's yeah, cool. I think it's like, so it like, was... like you were saying, spontaneously, we kind of come up with it, sound system, DJ and vibe, and then we're like, oh, I really like that idea. Uh, do we, do we know what rhythm that was? Let's try and get it together. The process kind of started really. Yeah. 
I've enjoyed all of those songs and we, funky the better as well. There's some <laughs> some we've wanted to do but we couldn't do because we were messing with the rights of two songs. You see mm, what I mean? Right. So then it becomes complicated. So I would imagine it's kind of like the boot bootleg mashup kind of thing, you know. So right, they're like, right. oh, it's going to be complicated because you got so it can't work. So it just has to live in the sound system arena. So we love that. For right. that. It's good fun. Heck yeah. Has there, sure. has, there, has there ever been a tune that you guys couldn't get the rights for? And you're like, dang it. We want this on the album. Uh, no, no. Everyone, if you do, because we don't sample, we replay everything. So then we get in touch oh, yeah, yeah, with, yeah, right. with the original co with the original writers and the publishers. Um, and it's funny. the When I when we did Nirvana's thing with Little Roy, everyone thought that uh, the Nirvana guys would like sue us and Courtney Love would send an assassin to kill me. And, right. these kind of, and I was like, wow, why, why would anyone do that? Whenever we do reggae versions, usually they call us up afterwards and go, wow, you guys are dope. Can't mm -hmm. believe you've done a reggae version of this or that and so on. That was, that was so, so wicked, by the way. That, that, like, uh, when I heard it, that was coming out. I heard about it before I heard it. And I was like, because I mean, I love Nirvana and I love Little Roy. And I was just like, that's, I never in a million years would have thought of that. What's that going to sound like? And it just like, I, it sounded like it was going to be some novel thing to me. I was like, oh, that's cute. And then when I heard it, I was like, oh, like it works. Like that's heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those, uh, th those, I think we, like, I think we didn't quite get it 100% right, but we were close in moments. There's a couple of moments. Like, come as you are, I think, come out. I think it's out. heavy. How I, how, I, how I imagined it. I was doing, you know, there's a, but yeah, but basically, yeah, the, um, you know, Dave Grohl and those guys got back in touch and said, hey, we love it. That Of course, you know, we're happy. You know, thank you for doing this. Then the publishers wow. got in touch with me and said, yo, We've got many more songs if you want to do reggae versions of wow. those. <laughs> it was funny. Nice. So, yeah, they didn't kill us or want to hurt us or Good. send lawyers Good. after us. No, no. <laughs> Everyone about, was uh, kind of paranoid that they were, you know. <laughs> How about um, uh, Snoop Dogg, when you guys, uh, when you did uh, the gin and juice thing, did did, yeah. he, did it ever get back to him? Did he dig it? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Because basically I got buddies that, 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 no and work with him and stuff like that so he he heard that yeah that was good fun man oh, yeah man. yeah yeah so we got that we got snoop's blessing from that for sure <laughs> that's nice. dude yeah, that yeah, yeah. i would never ever ex expect someone to do a, a cover of gin and juice and you guys and it was, it yeah, was in, dope. A one drop, was in a one drop in a one drop style <laughs> right right i was i was there. So, yeah and, and then um the old dirty bastard the, the shibby shibby yeah that's a great uh cover too Ooh, you know you know when when we did that it's because odb passed away and i love mm -hmm. you know i'm an i'm i guess 90s kid so like that so odb and the wu-tang clan and all those guys they they that was a big thing for me so uh when he passed i was like wow this is like the end of rock and roll like elvis dying right you know what mm -hmm. i mean and yeah. to me, yeah. I, I was like okay this is the end of hip-hop you know odb is gone it's like elvis has left the building Right. And that's why we did Shimmy Shimmy. And I used to hold, for one year, me and Horseman used to hold one minute silence in the clubs for ODB. And we wow. used to hold one minute silence and then play Shimmy Shimmy Yard. And the place would go, <laughs> wow. go crazy. Wow, you know? I can imagine. So we, all, we paid respects to ODB for pretty much a whole year, I think, or maybe longer. Nice. So, that's yeah. Awesome. Nice. Rest so, in peace, ODB. Yes. So I wanted to ask how how you two linked up and and like what uh, how you started working together. Wow. Well, um You want to tell that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's mystical and let's say that um Ja works in mysterious ways. Yes. But um definitely uh, So I used to work in a soul band called the Drysbone Soul Family and sang with them and that was kind of where I started singing live. Um in venues across, supported some amazing people, loved the band. Um, Mike knows the leader of Dry's Bone, Billy. He knows them from very young. And Billy was like, oh, I went to, I moved to Brighton to go to university. And he was like, oh, my friend lives in Brighton. At, at the time, Mike had a studio out there. And I was like, oh, okay. So I called, um, no, actually, Billy didn't give me your number for years. Actually, that's right. He Billy. mentioned. <laughs> all right, this guy, this guy Billy is a uh, is a crazy guy. Love very you, talented. Billy. So, so I'm not brother. too fond of Billy. I don't like Billy. Uh, basically, he 
he called me up and said, oh, yeah, you should really meet my singer Shanice has just moved to Brian. I was like, okay, cool, send me her number. And he never did. And then I was like, okay, well, whatever. And, and, you know, time, you don't think about it after that, right? Three years went by. Then yeah. It just goes past. And then I, Billy calls me up again. I said, yo, he goes, yo, you really should meet my singer. <laughs> she just moved to your town. I said, what the fuck is wrong with you? That's what you told me two years ago, <laughs> fool. What's wrong? I was like, what? <laughs> you okay, bro? That's what you told me two years ago, man. Right. He's like, okay, okay. I, I, sorry, man. You should have told me. I didn't, you know, whatever. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I don't always follow up on people. I'm not the kind of stalker type, if you see what I mean. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So like that. Anyway, so I guess I should have followed through. Yeah, so anyway, fine. this time he did send me, he, he sent me Shanice's number anyway. And then, uh, so yeah, I called you. And then you you happened to be doing a show literally in, in what, basically my, it my studio. It was across the road from his studio. My it's studio weird. Wow. right in the kind of heart, the music heartbeat of Brighton, basically. I mean, Brighton's a small little town, real small. But, you know, all the kind of little bars and clubs and kind of in the center. So, yeah, you were... You were yeah, I was green, across the road. Room, just whatever. did a little acoustic gig um, for a friend of mine. And by this time, I was on my way to finishing my exams and, like, finishing university. And... Um, yeah, so Mike came down to the gig and he was actually with Marcia from The Skints. And oh, yeah. mm. she came down and that was fun because I'd never met her before. So I was like, well, um, they came and watched the gig and then we went back to the studio and Mike was impressed and I got to see the the laboratory, shall we say. And um, yeah, it was. I think it kind of went from there. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, that night myself, I'd... Um, I'd had a bit of fun after getting off stage. So I do remember being very confident and Mike was playing some jams and I was like singing all over them. And I think, yeah, the rest is, the rest is kind of history. Yeah, it was a nice. fun evening. It was cool. At the time as well, I was doing little uh, things locally as well. So I think soon after that, anyway, you got to meet Horseman and then I on the sound it. system, you come and we had good fun. And I loved it. Horseman said to me, yo, wow, Shanice Dangerous, man. <laughs> and uh, I was like, "Whoa, you want to bring her on the on out in the sun?" And he was like, "Hell yeah, man! You have to bring her." So I said, "Okay, let's let's all right." You've got big up, and then I said to Shanice, "Yo, you want to come and bust up the sound system?" And she was like, "Yeah, you know, let's Heck go." Heck yeah! So then we we just hit the road and do our thing, and yeah, it's been good fun. Nice. We've been to Brazil a couple times, and all over Europe a bunch of times, and out in Thailand, and yeah. Where else? Dubai and places like that. It's been amazing, really. So, <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's good. It's nice to have, for me as a producer, and if you like Selector, to have Horseman and Shanice, wow, that's crazy for me. Because it's like having Josie Wells and Aretha Franklin. You understand? <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Wow, thank you. To no. me, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you got yeah. the soul. You know, to me, I love Josie Wells. And, you know, it's like, if you like, but on, on stage, you know, Horseman is... Is the boss just like Josie Wells? He's not the same kind of confidence oh. and coolness. And then you, right. you know, Shanice has, has got the R and B dagger, if you like, <laughs> and just you know, is ready to, to yeah, tear tear people up. So I think one of my cool. my favorite things about doing the sound system with you was was actually my first performance with Horseman. I remember being really really nervous, and I was like, he's so great, he's so good. How am I even gonna? And I know what we do is different, but I was just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to match up to him? <laughs> so I was watching him in awe from the um, the bottom of the stage. And then when I got on, he kind of just gave me a little, come, it's okay, it's all right. And I tell you, he made me feel so comfortable on stage. And I always have to pick up Force Man for making, I don't know, just making the vibes really, really comfortable, relaxed. It's almost like I'm sitting in the studio and singing with just you, him, and Horseman. I mean, mm-hmm. you and Horseman. But to actually just be on that stage and just feel like there's no one even watching you is just amazing. He's right. He's got a real talent. He really has. That, I mean, yeah, he was born for that. That's important. Me and Devin talk about it all the time. I mean, working with musicians or being in a band with musicians, how important the offstage thing yeah. is just as much as them being a badass musician. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's even more important. Uh, because, more important, I would even yeah. say. Because yeah. if there's that connection, then you end up bringing something totally different to the table um, than if you didn't really get along. Because then there's, there's something kind of an invisibility shield kind of blocking you from being able to connect musically as well. So I think 
that right. was really, really, really nice for me. Yeah. Nice. Big up horsemen. <laughs> yeah, big up horsemen. Big up the skins too. You mentioned the skins. Yeah, and, big up the skins. You know, we those are some good friends of ours. Like we had um, Josh and John on the on the show a few weeks ago, and you know, I the band the, the expanders that I was in for years did did some touring with the Skins out here, and then Rogers Group, the Agrilites, did some touring with the Skins in uh, in Europe, and um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you. You I, I know Fatty, you've worked with the Skins like in some professional capacity, but I wanted to ask you guys, you know, what your relationship with those with those fine people are. Yeah, well, you know, funny enough, I was I spoke to Josh today. It's funny. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, 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 just today. Uh, I think he wanted to come come and hang out on Tuesday. He's gonna say, "Yo, yeah, oh, long," because basically, I, I was in Thailand for the lockdown, so I've been away for a long time through that this whole period. I only came back to the UK at the end of July, so um, I haven't really, got, you know, it's only in the last. I mean, things have been a little bit funny again now, but. It's only been in the last few months that we've actually started to kind of mingle a little bit. Mm -hmm. if you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll hang out. But yeah, we're friends. Um, when I first met them, well, it was quite a long time ago now, man. Because I think it was their second album that they came to me to do. So um, and that feels like a long time ago. I think that was like 10 years ago. Wow. Something yeah, like that. Was. Yeah. So we've known each other a long time. Cool. So, um after I did that, that album with them, then, uh, the, yeah, they just kept coming back. And, you know, Josh would come and DJ sometimes for me on my sound s system things or party things. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, they're friends and family, you know. It's all good. Cool. Nice. Cool. So, um, yeah. the, I know, wow, they've, I mean, they've been all over. They're probably one of the hardest working bands I know in the for sense sure. of live, like Definitely. live shows, like being out there all the time. So, right. Yeah. And then yeah. Josh has come up to Thailand and hung out, and he, we did some of the work on on the last album, on the Swimming Lessons album. We did mm -hmm. some of that in Thailand too. He came out and hung out and helped wow. me smuggle some equipment there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. He jumped on the plane with me, and and yeah, we he... took a bunch of preamps into Thailand, and it was all cool, you know. <laughs> So, just just your average day smuggling a space echo in your pants. No, no, yeah, it was actually SSL modules. It was SSL modules this time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeez, man. But, uh, no problem, man. It's just a couple of you know. Yeah. Yeah. What do they call it? Like a couple of gringos walking through. It's all good. Smiles. Oh, good. Yeah. Are you going yeah. to the beach? Yeah, going to the beach. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Um, we're through. No problem. Nice. <laughs> But yeah, Thai authority is awesome. Anyway, big up Thailand. I have to say, big up Thailand and my brother out there, Gap, yeah. T Bone, mm -hmm. uh, my whole Thai family, because they really looked after me. They look after me anyway. But in the whole COVID thing, it was looking a bit moody and stuff. And I have to right. say that all the the Thai authorities as well, everyone was cool. They said, please don't leave the country, don't travel. Your don't worry about your visa. You've all got automatic visa extensions. Stay safe. Don't move. And yeah, so I was. That I think it's crazy because it's a military dictatorship, but actually I think they ended up being more humane than most mm. other places. Funny. Crazy how that works, huh? So that's, that's my observation for the day. So, <laughs> I'm not saying that they're the system, you know, that they're perfect. I don't mean that. But in this occasion, how they did it all, I think right. was 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 very good because they just wanted everyone to be safe. Really, I guess. Definitely. And it, it kind of worked. They. They even shut the beer down, had curfew after 10 o'clock, no alcohol sales for like a month or two. So, Whoa. yeah. So I was lucky. Really? I, had a, I had a friend of mine with a restaurant down the road. So I literally just. Yeah, you know, I was talking Prince to. Fatty style. I just went down there and <laughs> yeah. we were okay. We had a few cases of beer anyway to see us through. You, you stopped me right there. That's some strong words right there. I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, mom. I'm, yeah, not going, I'm not going to Thailand. I'm sorry, I mean, Jesus. You know, <laughs> they have a cool. curfew. Don't worry, the beer. You can buy beer at 7 Eleven. Oh, okay. Now, it's okay. Oh, okay, that's cool. It was, only, it was only for the first the first couple of months of the pandemic. I think they didn't Ooh, want nice. people to go crazy and party, you know? I just remember so. talking to, to Mike about the. Um, the toilet paper issue and he was like there's no toilet paper issue here and yeah, i was yeah. like no problem. why is it just the uk there's toilet paper issues no, <laughs> over, <laughs> over here it wasn't just the uk let me tell over you here. Just, over here over here toilet were, paper mm. issues too oh man oh, yeah. people were fighting each other we my my wife ordered some toilet paper from china some like bamboo toilet paper and it took 
it took months to get here. So like we forgot that we ordered it. And then like one day, just like this package showed up. We're like, what is this? And we opened it. We're like, oh, it's the Chinese toilet paper. And it was like, we didn't realize it was like, it was like this. The rolls were like this, like teeny. We had like hundreds of like these teeny little rolls. We still got them. Still, I got those rolls. Does it work? Oh Does the bamboo toilet it, paper it work? It works. It works. Hey, it does the job. <laughs> good, good. Yes. Oh. That's crazy. The hoarding of toilet paper. Uh, I was hoping we'd get on that subject today. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Oh, no, guys. no. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thailand, Thailand was safe. Anyway, big up. Yeah. Thank you for bringing Prince Fatty back in one piece, Thailand. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we do this this segment um, at the end of our shows, and it's called the Rapid Fire questions we like to have fun with our guests as we send them off and, and thank them so it's super easy we're going to ask uh, you guys a question and you guys answer it it should be like an a b kind of thing you know mm -hmm. kind of sure, not sure. too much thinking into it you know just want to get a like have fun how with bad it. are the questions though <laughs> we're pretty oh they're we pretty deep. fast tongues anyway go go <laughs> they are deep Devin, are we, are we ready over Should there Devin? yeah you go ahead you go ahead i'm gonna go for it okay so we'll start off with shanice whiskey or tequila tequila fatty whiskey or tequila well i would go with tequila too definitely oh. yeah yeah nice yeah yeah okay fatty dinner or dessert dinner every time but a slow one yeah okay Janice, dinner or dessert <laughs> just a slow dinner what i mean is dessert like, all the time yeah not like a Ooh. yeah yeah i like to yeah. eat slow take your time what i call slow food instead of mm -hmm. fast food you know okay so yeah definitely yeah yeah i would and, i would take a slow dinner over a fast dessert all anytime. right and and Janice, you said dessert definitely dessert yeah oh there we go that was our first okay so i got a, a different question for each of you we'll start with you Shanice. Tina Turner or Lynn Collins? <gasps> you have to pick one. How can you? I'm, that's why I do this. That's a tough one. Okay, I, I'm sorry, but because I know both their catalogs, and I'm just doing it down to preference, okay? Lynn mm -hmm. Collins. Oh, okay. Yes. So you hate Tina Turner. Okay. I don't on. hate her. <laughs> it's on the record. It's all right. <laughs> and now the same kind of I thing. You, but, <laughs> same kind of thing, but for Fatty, Lee Perry or the Scientist? Oh wow, easy question, Lee Perry. Okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah Lee Perry, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Now I was talking the dubs. You know, I mean, Lee Perry obviously is a, you know, but yeah, they, they all got their different flavors. Go ahead, Devin. I'm okay. I'm just a just a clarify. I'm I do rate Scientist. But um, I have to say, Lee Perry, I think, at his peak, he was like a magician, basically. Right. So go on. Yeah, yeah there's, there's magic in that. And that's hard to, hard, to, hard to match. Is it fair to say that even he would win over Tubby? That was going to be my question. No, nah, Tubby's, Tubby's the boss. Nice. Yeah, okay. Okay. I have to say Tubby's the boss. And I hate to beat down on scientists, but he would be in the lowest league of my top 10 if you like crazy he would be at number probably nine or ten i'd mm -hmm. put errol thompson above scientist errol t prince jammy sorry I, i'm you know just no no i get yeah, it yeah. Yeah. Hates tina turner fatty hates man, you know <laughs> <laughs> so you hate tina turner no, listen, and I, I know him he's cool i don't mean that to be disrespectful i'm just no, I know, sorry I know. you know him too we know he's him amazing, too, yeah. you know and we're cool you know, yeah of course but, oh, um, you can tell him right now. Scientist. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get him on the session, yeah? No, no, no. Open. no, 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 not at all. <laughs> anyway, oh my big, big up, scientist. No, <laughs> yeah, scientist sure. is the point of that. Whole... Okay, uh, Shanice, mayonnaise or mustard? Mayonnaise. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Me too. Hate mustard, sorry. Ooh, there you go. Yeah, Hate, I said it. hate mustard, okay. Um... Fatty, mayonnaise or mustard? Same question. Man, I'm a I'm a mayonnaise guy too. That's why we're good on the road. We have that on the rider, you know. <laughs> yeah, the no, rider. I can, I can hang with mayo, the mayo rider. Now we huge can jug hang. of mayo. Some people, some people, you like mayonnaise is one of those things that like is really like controversial to people. Like some people just hate mayonnaise. 
at least in, in the U.S. Why yeah, is it controversial? Course. Some people just yeah, hate no, it. Like, it's it. like they a, the... They're like, they see you eating, they see you putting mayonnaise on I, your food. And, it's true, but it's I'm, true. I'm mustard too, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they either love it or hate it. Same yeah. thing. You know, we're we're it, on the mayonnaise side for sure. That's it was always a trip. Like when I first toured Europe, um, I'm like, where's the mayo and mustard? And then the promoter would be, it's right there. But it looks like some ointment. It'd be like in a tube. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it'd just be a little weird for me. I'm like, like mm, in Germany or something? Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so hold on. How do you have mayo? Oh, uh, where you, where you? Oh, it's it's oh, like jar. in a it's Flash in a jar. jar. I guess that's yeah. what we're used to over here. It's just like yeah, in a jar. Oh, so you just don't have it in a squeezy bottle? No, but that's butter. Thing. I think that's, you mean the, or even the sachet yeah. things. You know, like the yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. Just, I just I know what you mean. Also, sometimes in Europe they're so small, the little packet things that they give you of mayonnaise, right? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. And you open it and you squeeze it and you're like. Okay. What am I gonna do with that? I mean, right. it's just. I'm not I'm saying like, eat you my want mayo. Old, you don't want. I'm not saying you need a big old scoop of it. I don't mean I'm gonna be that far. I need sometimes. a big old scoop of it. Devin you loves mayo. Those, yeah. You squeeze those little That's ones, and I'm mayo. like, oh, wow, I'm gonna need like six of these. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ne the next one. We'll start with Fatty. Uh, texting or talking? Wow. Yeah, I'm definitely more of a talker than a texter. Okay. I'm actually, I don't even have a smartphone. Check this. This is my phone. That I, is I'm his not phone. A, I promise oh. I'm not a drug dealer. Oh, but it's the oh same yeah. One that, it's the <laughs> same one. Okay. Why did you say that? Actually, don't joke. My son actually said to me, Dad, why have you got that phone? Are you a drug dealer? And I, I said, no, son. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. Because one of his friends said, yo, only drug dealers have that phone. Are you sure your dad's not a drug dealer? That would be my oh, follow-up question. I'd be like, son, how do you know that drug Yeah, how do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, one of his buddies asked. Yeah. So, yeah, I had to kick his ass after that. <laughs> and That's friend. cool. I, I could I see, like, the only reason I have a smartphone, honestly, is, like, for, you know, posting with the band and stuff like that. Otherwise, man, there's just so much, so many more cons than pros in your yes, in the personal it. life, you know? Yeah, I have so, a little gripe with them because often I just find everyone's distracted by them. So oh, yeah. sometimes in the studio, maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm playing back the song to people and everyone's just looking at their phones and I'm right. like, wow, okay, do they hate it then? Yeah, Is they that why lives. they're looking they at their lives. phone? Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's a bit strange sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're playing. Like, imagine I've mixed your song for you. Come in and you sit down on the couch. Oh, that's horrible. You yeah, you don't even make it to the first verse without going online and checking your emails or something. That's horrible. You know? How many likes do I have? Like, well, yeah, right. I don't know, it's a bit strange. Or sometimes I see people do shows, and as they're coming off stage, they're almost opening their laptops to see what the comments that people have made or something. I, I don't know. Right. It's a bit too much. Yeah, for I sure. Think, yeah, you need a little downtime and vinyl time and try and love yeah so like i relax with the turntable so yes yeah, me too you see what i mean so oh, for sure where where yeah. possible and so shanice right. same question texting or talking <laughs> i hate talking on the phone i love that you guys yeah are you're more of a text I, I hate talking i just can't me i message. just I don't like the long dragged out conversation, so it's yeah. definitely texting. It's just, it's like, okay, I can give you time, but then uh, if you go over that time, I'll get annoyed with you and it's not your fault. So then I just decide what? to text you. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. I love it. No, I agree with you totally, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Do you, Richie? Yeah, okay. I really do. I'm more of a text. It's because, check it out, people can text you and you can kind of have a conversation at your both, at your own leisures. Maybe you're in the yeah. middle of something and you can you can uh, multitask. Talking, and there's some people you talk and it's like, all right, now I'm going to spend the next hour and a half talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of people like that in my life, so I think that's why I like to text. Oh, sorry okay, cool. I missed your call. Okay. That's why I get so many texts from Shanice. I've just outed myself. M Mike's yeah, like, oh, that's why you don't pick up my calls. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm just too cool. Uh, <laughs> Some people really can't pick up on the like vocal, the intonation of like, now we're ending the call, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your voice goes in a certain direction. It's like, all right, well, 
you know, one of those. And then people are like, oh, that reminds me. And it's like the next story comes and you're like, okay. oh, yeah, that's always the good one, right? We're like, all right, okay, so then Saturday, okay, yeah. great. Oh, you know what? Also, oh, darn, darn. I just figured out how to make this cookie recipe. So check this out. And then they go into like another 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm yeah. sorry. I've got to do. And then I end up making up the most worst ex like excuses ever. Oh, no. I love it. For why I've got to go. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got something yeah. on the stove. And they know I'm out, and it's really, really bad. Yeah, just, that's an I'm old school hoping. excuse. Something on the yeah. tea kettles going off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always like, my hamster got out of the cage. I'll be back. I gotta go. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I gotta chase this guy down. My hamster's out. Sorry, <laughs> De Devin. You have you have any more of the, the rapid yeah, fire? Yeah, let's let's close it out. I'm mm -hmm. trying to see. I got a couple good ones. Devin's got good ones. Uh, <laughs> okay, audio book or physical book? This is for Shanice first. Okay, physical book, but audio books, I respect them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, cool. Too much respect for the audio books. I do, I do. You know, I've never done an audio book. Oh, oh no, no, no. I don't mean that. It doesn't mean. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. You mean. No, no, I'm just <laughs> saying. I've never actually downloaded one and oh, checked no? it out. Never it's in cool my because, life. No. Like, it, they're great because you can do it while you're, you know, while you're driving, while you're riding your bike. And like, especially if you're, if you're too busy in your life to like, you're reading, you're not reading as many books as you wish you could be reading then in your, in your downtime, you know, like when you're just walking no, or doing something. Like 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 a very good idea. And if it's narrated by a nice voice. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say crucial. that's the crucial. only issue. Crucial. Why I've, uh, what was, what book was it? Oh, something with Oprah Winfrey. And I didn't think her voice annoyed me, mm -hmm. but until I was listening to it three, like two hours and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't listen to her anymore. <laughs> um, on a talk show for a couple minutes, it's fine. I mean, sorry. Oh no. I'm right. showing Tina, my true colors Tina now. Turner. Turner. Please, Tina I Turner. love it. I love it. <laughs> you know what, Tina's Long on the phone. Yeah. Sorry. You take that yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tina and Scientist are uh, making a revenge album. The worst is like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Scientists meet <laughs> Tina and Oprah in, uh, yeah. in, in uh, Thailand yeah, dub smuggling. I think fashion. Oprah's financing it. She's got the money. <laughs> yeah, right. so she's going to build scientists. I most, love you, Oprah. New, <laughs> the most amazing new studio in California. Uh, Oprah watches this show too. So I love yeah. you. I, I do. I do, actually. <laughs> and, and I love Tina Turner. Um, <laughs> Oprah should, should buy scientists a new studio anyway. That would be great. You no, there you go, campaign. Oprah. Right? Oprah, please buy scientists a brand new studio. Yeah, he deserves one. Okay. Or donate to all the musicians that have no work at the moment. Thank you. Ooh. Yeah, right? She, <laughs> she okay. just logged off. Her screen name was Oprah 420. And I saw that name. Oh, and no. logged off. <laughs> so sorry, guys. <laughs> Oprah 420. I thought, dude. No, I have love. I have love, really. Um, but her voice just gets annoying after an hour. But anyway... Thank you. <laughs> so um as we as we close what where can people go right now to like pick up the new the new single i mean no it's on the, all the digital things but is there like a seven inch or and just okay. in general how can people go support uh shanice and fatty right now right now with the band the band camp is the best thing for us mm, so cool. if you can't support support us via the band camp and order through that i know you might have to wait like a week or something for them to mail it out to you um but if you can be patient then wow, the band camp is Thank the you. best for us. And we love band camp. It's really, yeah, they've been saving us through this whole Definitely. COVID experience while a lot of the record shops shut down or couldn't trade or whatever. So it's, yeah, big respect to band camp to, nice. yeah, to keep the music community going. And also, and just... the horsemandrums.com fans, because I have to say big thanks for that. Because, yeah. um, you know, yeah, very good. So I'm sure Horseman at some stage will say thank you to his fans for that. So it's good. Big up. We got to get Horseman on the show. This is, you know, we talked. You to, so have to. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about him on the Skins episode and now on this episode. So it's like, I feel like the next step is Horseman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you know could, what? Uh, Actually, Shanice lives in the same neighborhood as Horseman. So I'm neighbors. sure we could possibly help you coordinate that if you see Heck what I mean. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Send him so a text. Good. Don't talk to him. Send him a text. <laughs> yeah, send him a text. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't call Horseman. No, but, um, just right, before I'll, be, I'll I forget, text you next time. Just Roger, before yeah. I forget. I won't ever email you or call you, I promise. <laughs> just before I forget as well. Um, Bandcamp as well and wavering their fees next Friday. So please, Ooh. if you can, Ooh. get on it next Friday, the 3rd, I believe it is. 
Um, so yeah, just bye 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 bye. <laughs> nice. Stream nice. stream. Yeah. And a big thanks to Grace Slick, Jefferson Airplane, and all the cool San Francisco ravers. Because she wrote that song. Big up, yep, big up Grace yeah. Slick. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, don't do pills. That's why. No pills, anybody. Is, yeah, no, it's not good. Go down the rabbit hole, but not too far. Yeah. Right, right. Half a you got to be able to go back. You understand? Yes. Sure. I love it when Alice goes, but why? But why? No. Time to take a pill. What kind of place yeah, is this? Uh, pills not good, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting too excited now. Oh, this is great. Go. This is excellent. I love it. Love it. <laughs> Yo, big up, guys. Ruth yeah, Pride, man, thank Evan, you. Roger, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thanks for all the support in the past. Big up for all the nice things. I know you've done, you, you've picked me up many times out there before. So, so thank you very much and the, the support promoting Horseman and the horsemandrums.com. Yes, in fact, sure. I owe you guys some drum samples. So I'm going to email you. Ooh, All right. We love it. I mean, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's we got lovely. a new batch. This is one of the things we were recording this week. The the kind of so a lot of new fresh fresh batch of drum That's sounds. Awesome. And That's awesome. Things. Thank you. Well, Fatty oh, and Shanice, you thank you. Thank you thank so you. much for coming on. Really appreciate it. We look forward to, to all the yes. all the works that are coming and you know, we hope to talk to you guys soon and you know, maybe even link up before too long. When the world goes back go. to something you normal. let us know when you're in london and uh cool. one you day let us know when yeah, we're in la when you, one day sure. it'll be nice to come back to cali you know yeah yes yeah. most definitely That's all right it. you too right you on good. thank take you care. take Big care guys. Guys. peace take out later later yeah man that was too much fun at, at the end so just fun. being wild with it i love it i love it so fun Ooh, i say this all the time but like i just miss i miss people you know i miss <laughs> like doing this show it's just you're like ah i want to hang with yeah, people you're gonna have to right now you just have gussie your your dog and gussie and, no, and vanessa no, and patrick it, I, i'm vanessa lucky to have patrick a are people they're people but they're they like are. people they're like regular people you want yeah you need some some excitement yeah 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 <laughs> some people that aren't that i don't yeah exactly Anyway, yeah, not Tina Turner. No, I don't um, know. Either. No, 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 yeah. dude. Next Saturday we have the Wailing Souls oh, on dude. the show. Pipe and Bread are coming on. Yeah, I'm really yeah. excited about this. I've I love the Wailing Souls so much. It's one of my absolute like top five favorite Jamaican groups. I was lucky enough to do some some work with them in in 2008. Expanders backed them for a show. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've I've. A few years ago, we went to a revolution show. We were backstage at the Greek and Pipe was there. And uh, him and I like started started talking and we did a little like we started singing some harmonies together. Like he's what? Those, are just great. those are great dudes. Um, so we got the legends, the Wailing Souls on next week. So everyone, please be sure to tune into that. It's going to be fun, man. Yeah, man. Um, the, I see you only got me down here at the bottom. I, I don't have anything got new. Up. I got nothing, man. I'm just like. That's it, huh? I gave up music, man. I mean, geez. You know. Well, I'll tell people one thing Roger and I have been doing. We're we've been we're in the mixing phase of of my new record, uh the acoustic yes. record. And uh it's it's really, really we're almost at the finish line. Uh mixes are coming out great. My brother Patrick and I were were over at Roger's pad last week and uh, all with masks on, of course, doing some 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 mixing for the record and uh I'm just like seeing this light at the end of the tunnel, you know, it's like a beautiful feeling. This will be, you know you and I have recorded enough records to know that like there comes a point where you like, you wonder if it's ever really going to get done. You're like, mm -hmm. man, it's just like, and then when you start to actually realize, Oh, this is, this is going to get done. This is actually going to be like a right finished there. project. So we're yeah. there right now. So it's a beautiful feeling. Yeah. And it's, and it's great, great music, man. I'm a, I'm a big Devin fan as, as a writer. I mean, oh. all the expander stuff and, and his solo stuff doesn't disappoint. It's right along the same writing quality i mean geez every time he'd give me a demo i'm like all right cool I, I, i'm like the i get this new music i get to vibe nice. out too so i'm a true fan of Devin, and this album is just so unique that people it, it's just a win-win situation and i can't wait for it to be done too so people can it's a different it. one it's got my, my brother playing a lot of instruments on it uh we got my dad playing harmonica on one track mm -hmm. um so stoked stoked really for cool it stuff yeah um all right everyone please Tune in next Saturday for the Wailing Souls. In the meanwhile, uh, you can email us at the Reggae Podclash at gmail.com. You can go check the Reggae Podclash.com website and go follow us on all the socials. Tell your friends. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, 
please go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review it. That really helps to like up our visibility. If you give us a five star review and write a little write a little something in there about yeah how you can't live without the show and it's your it's your favorite favorite addiction. And um, until next week, man, everyone be good. Uh, do something good for somebody else. And yes. uh, Raj, I'll see you. I'll see you. Uh, well, this week probably we're gonna do some mixing some again. We'll do yeah? some mixing for sure, man. All right, and we'll see everyone uh, Saturday for the Wailing Souls.